Hi guys, welcome to my YouTube channel and here once again I am presenting a new video from PhD from abroad series and this video is going to be about PhD from Japan and in this video I have specially invited Ms. Afsan who is doing her PhD from University of Tsukuba and also working as a junior researcher in National Institute of Material Science. So in this video we will cover the topics like how do you approach a professor in Japan, how to get admission, what is the formal and informal procedure, what are the tuition fees and all related things in this video. So if you have not liked this video, just like this video, subscribe to the channel and also follow me on the social media handles, especially on Instagram, which I have mentioned the link somewhere above. So let's start this video and have some knowledge of PhD from Japan. Hi Afsan, how are you? Hi Dr. Mono, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm very fine. So first of all, I would like to thank you for joining this and giving some information to the aspirants because most of them were asking if I can make any video in Japan. So I know you're from Japan and doing your PhD. So can you please introduce yourself so that for the audience? Uh, hi, Monu. Thank you for giving me this platform. I'm Afshan. I am doing my PhD from Japan through Tsukuba University and I'm working as a junior researcher at the National Institute. So, Afsan, my first question is, why did you choose abroad for your PhD? Mm, there are a lot of points why I selected abroad, especially Japan. First of all, the research area where I'm working in, Japan is one of the leading countries in my research area. Secondly, my current mentor is in the same field as I was pursuing in my master's. And the PhD program that I'm currently working in has me working at a research institute instead of a university. So the quality of research and the number of publication increases a lot as compared to a university. Also, my degree is registered at a university, which is amongst the top 500 universities in the world. So when I plan to come back to India, one of the criteria of joining a university in India is already ticked off. What was the exact procedure? How did you apply? Like from the informal part, that is from applying via email to a professor to the formal part, how did, uh, did it all proceed? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very important step that I started during my master's. I first of all made a list of a prospective guides that were in my field during the masters based on the research area, the lab group, and if I wanted a career in academics or if I wanted to work in a company after I complete my PhD, and last but not the least, the countries which are leading in my area. So Japan was one of the countries. Then I met my current guide at an international conference where I built communication with him and we exchanged contacts. After the international conference, we conversed on email where I expressed my interest in his research by sharing the views on his research paper and sharing my master's work that I was pursuing during my master's research work. And he got an interest in my master coursework and then things clicked. Now, one of the key points that I learned during this informal process is that it takes time because you are talking to a professor over email. So it takes time to build communication. You need to build trust. And then uh, as expected, a research is about building communication, networking and collaborating. So during this informal stage, it's necessary to build trust with the prospective guide. And it goes a long way if you are pursuing your PhD in Japan. So then I moved on to the formal procedure of PhD, where the first step was to apply for assistantship or a scholarship. After applying for the scholarship, I went on for the college application, where you are shortlisted on the basis of grades, your research experience, and the letters by your previous supervisors. That's a very important step. On the basis of your college application, you would be shortlisted for an interview. Now, this interview might be a Skype interview or a fly into Japan, depending on the institute that you are applying. Given the current situation of Corona, they would 
prefer to have a Skype interview when you are shortlisted after the college application? So, Afsan, as you have said about the formal process, uh, what was the, exactly the documents were required for the formal process? Uh, the documents required were in two parts. That is the academic documents and the non-academic documents. In the academic part, you would first of all need an application form that is available on the website of each university and a detailed CV. Then okay. a letter regarding your research where you explicitly mention about your research experience, your research achievements and a proposal what you would like to do in the coming years. Apart okay. from this, you will need academic transcripts of your highest degree. For me, it was my master's and a document called degree certificate that can be procured from your university itself. Moving on to the non-academic documents, the most important is passport and yes. a document for the funding application. Okay. Uh, the key point here is uh, the process seems a bit tedious, but every university has their own fixed format which is downloaded from their own website. So you just download it and fill in the information according to that format. That's pretty easy. Awesome. What about the English language test? This, uh, is there any kind of English language test required like IELTS or TOEFL? Hmm. When you are applying for a PhD in Japan, you will need a language test certificate for English because oh. we as Indians, we don't have English as a first language. So any examination can be like GRE, TOEFL, IELTS, any examination is all right. Uh, one examination that I would recommend if you are applying only for Japan is TOEIC. That is the test of English for international communication. I would recommend this examination because it's very easy for Indians to score high marks on this test. Plus, mm -hmm. the cost of this examination is very nominal as compared to other examinations. And since it's easy to score in TOEIC, if you would go through the curriculum of TOEIC, you would see it's pretty easy to score. So if you have a high score, it gives you a plus point in your application when you apply and it's judged on the basis of your grades. I would recommend TOEIC examination. So coming to the next part is what exactly was the criteria of selection? Like was it your experience? Was it your papers or was it your like marks? What exactly made the highest impact in your application? In research, they see the holistic development of a candidate. Okay. So when they go through your application, they obviously look at your grades. Apart from grades, they see how you develop and research during your master's. This can be either in terms of the paper you publish, or if you don't have a paper, it's not an issue. They would see what kind of work you have achieved during your master's okay. and what kind of work you have learned. One of the important thing is the exposure to different kind of labs. The internships that you do during and before your master's are a key point to be mentioned here. For example, I worked for one and a half year at IISC. I worked for three months as an intern student at BARC. So I mentioned all of this. So it was one of the key points in my application. After you're shortlisted in your application, then comes the interview. Interview is very important in Japan. Whatever you do, you have to give an interview. It's pretty easy. Uh, you present whatever recent achievements were in your research work. Then you present how you did it. And there would be a group of professors uh, judging you and seeing your presentation. After it's over, they will be asking you questions regarding your work. It's pretty easy and communicate in English. It's very easy to crack the interview. So, Akshan, the next question is about fellowship and tuition fees. How much fellowship you are getting and what is the tuition fees there? The average scholarship or assistantship that you receive in Japan is about 150,000 Japanese yen per month. And okay. an average tuition fees is 600,000 Japanese yen per year. One thing I would like to mention here is that the cost of living in Japan is about 90,000 Japanese yen per month. Now, this okay. includes apartment rent, insurance, food, and any miscellaneous expenditure. So the okay. amount between your tuition fees and the scholarship that you're obtaining, it's pretty much nominal. And you will not have to ask for any support from back home. You can basically support your life very easily in Japan. 
Now, if you are living in a relatively big city like Tokyo or Sapporo, your cost of living might increase a little bit, but still it's pretty much manageable. So basically, whatever you are getting is enough to complete, you know, you know, complete all your expenses and, and or like you will ultimately save something. That's what I have seen. <laughs> yeah, we can save. Okay. Uh, that depends basically on how much you spend and what's your cost of living, what kind of life you like to live. So what is the average duration of PhD in Japan and how it is different from Indian scenario? Hmm. So if you're applying for a PhD in Japan, it comes in two periods. First is the five year and second one is the three years. If you're applying for five years, you have to do a coursework for one and a half years to two years and then carry on your research. And if you're doing for three years, it would be without coursework. Now, how would you select if you want to do for five years or three years? Yes. I would recommend that if you have research experience in terms of writing a paper, writing a proposal, and you have a well-defined goal with literature survey, then you can mention this to your prospective supervisor. Then he will help you to guide to a scholarship that is meant for either five years or for three years. So for example, I am pursuing a PhD for three years. So uh, I did not have to do any coursework and I had a research plan already outlined before I started my three years work. So at the end, after two and a half years of my admission to this process, I would have to submit the first draft of my thesis. So it's important to have the outline of your research defined before you start three years work. Okay. So basically, if you have any kind of research experience, you will be getting into like three years. And if you don't have your like, fresh masters, then probably you will go in the five years program. Yeah. Uh, the PhD scenario in Japan is a bit different than from India because the student mentor relationship starts even before we come to Japan. So when you're basically in India, your guide will help you in filling out the forms, writing a research proposal, and he will help you out in a very detail oriented way until you come to Japan. And even when you come to Japan, you get to have weekly discussions with him and very rigorous follow ups until you start to learn what King by yourself. Okay. After a certain period of time, he would let you work on your own and uh, things get a bit easier and you follow up. Uh, yes. Moving ahead, moving ahead mm -hmm. in Japan, when you're working in a research group, it's better to have a group behavior rather than an individual behavior that is usually seen in India. Uh, okay. That's about the environment in lab. Apart from it, uh, the funds and research al resource allocation in Japan is a little bit better than India, mainly because the population is less as compared to our country. And procurements of any instruments or softwares that you need is heavily supported by the group leader. And the paperwork in Japan is very fast, so it's very speedy. Uh, apart from uh, the research work, once in a while, you would go to dinner with your boss and we always look forward to nomikai parties. Nomikai party is where you have barbecue and drinks with your lab group and other lab groups. It's a fun way to socialize. We look forward to it. So my next question is about the lifestyle. And is there any kind of racism, discrimination or anything you felt? Because Japan is very, you know, very much known for lengthier work hours and so on. Yeah. So first of all, we work very rigorously during the weekdays. So yes. If you are having results during your weekly discussions, you are good to go and you can manage your work as you want. So one thing I would recommend here is be in the lab before your supervisor. If you are uh, working in shift and or handling some instruments, that's completely OK. But in general, it's better to be in the lab before the supervisor. Secondly, the weekends are off. If you would like to complete your work before a deadline, that's completely OK. But weekends are off and you can be go outdoors and have fun over the weekends. So, uh, one of the benefits that I'd mentioned being a student in Japan is you get a lot of benefits for traveling around in Japan. 
especially the bullet train Shinkansen. Otherwise, it's a bit pricey if you're not a student. As a worker, it's very, you are very much respected, so you don't face any discrimination. The last thing is, uh, any trip, tips, uh, tips or suggestions for the future students who wish to apply to Japan? How would they prepare and anything like that? What they might know. So if you are applying in Japan, please have a clear communication with your professor and build trust. That is very important and it goes very long way if you are pursuing PhD in Japan. Uh, next, don't hesitate in asking questions. Be very clear and respect time. It goes long way here in Japan. Uh, no. we, uh, there's a trend in Japan to apply just at the starting date itself. They don't like to wait for the last date. So if you're approaching your professor, if you're filling out any application, please do it by the first date itself. That's a good behavior assumed here. And uh, don't hesitate, uh, don't be strict and have parallel plans. Everything will work out. So thank you very much, Afsan. That was all that I have. If I have, would have any questions in future, I will definitely contact you. And I sincerely thank you for sparing your time for this activity. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mono. I'm happy to help. So guys, I think this would this was very interesting as well as informative video. If you have liked the content, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel and you can follow me on instagram and other social media as well for some related information which i keep sharing on these handles for further question you can put your questions in the comment section and i will answer them as far as my convenience okay thank you very much